Ladies and gentlemen, this video is being placed on the SATCOM website for those who have acquired SATPACs who are our clients. This information is made available to the general public, but it applies to those who are our clients, our partners in the venture for which we have in common. This is about capacities. A lot of people have heard about status and a lot of people are concerned about how their status is recorded in our society. It is in some instances about status, but status must be recognized for what it is. So let's go ahead and examine how the system identifies us. Everyone knows about this thing known as the straw man. Well, the straw man is a capacity. It is not a actual living, breathing entity. It is not, everybody keeps saying, I am not this, I am not a straw man, I am not a corporation. You are absolutely right. You are not. A straw man is a representation. Capacity is a representation. And because it is a representation of something, real or imagined, their system requires there to be insurance. Now, why is there a necessity for there to be insurance? Go ahead and look at everything you do under that capacity, you are required to be insured. You get a automobile, you're required to have insurance. You get a corporation, you're required to have insurance. Just in case you damage one of the people. Now, if you don't understand what is being stated, it is the people who have rights. Now, who are these people? Well, as we just discussed, the original constitution, and that's what people are not understanding what a constitution is. So. If you don't understand what a constitution is, do a little bit of research. Look up the word constitution. Look up the word trust agreement. And understand that a constitution and many trusts have constitutions. Go ahead. Do your research and find out that many trust agreements have constitutions. If that is the case, stop talking about your constitutional rights. You have none. No constitution can grant you a right. They can grant you a privilege. They can grant you a benefit, but not a right. Rights are not something that you acquire. You cannot go out and get a right. You cannot go and get the right to freedom of speech. You cannot go to get the right to be free. You cannot go and get the right to peacefully assemble. These are common rights. They are rights possessed by all people. That is why the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights recognizes each one of those that are listed as Bill of Rights in the U.S. Constitution. Now, for two reasons that is the case, because the United Nations was formed by the United States. Originally, the U, um, see, what was it called originally? The League of Nations. Again, a creation of the United States and Great Britain. The United Nations, a creation of the United States and Great Britain. You don't have to take my word for it. You can go and do the research as to how was it formed. I think the United, Na the League of Nations was Wilson. And going before the UN and all of this wonderful um, hoopla. And then in 1945, at the end of the war, it was Roosevelt. Well, if you pay attention, it was neither Wilson nor Roosevelt who came up with the idea of the United Nations. If you did your research, you will find that it was a group of individuals who introduced this to them, this new concept of uniting the nations to end so-called war. Now we know all wars, now most of you will say that wars have gotten started because of the banks, because of finances, 
No, not so. All of the wars on the earth have always been as a result of religious conflicts, differences of what individuals believe. Don't believe me? Well, go ahead and take a look at the most recent wars. Was not the war in Afghanistan that they claimed the war on terror? Didn't Bush continue to say that they were in a war against ideologies, i.e. religion? This is our society. This is mankind. Every war that has ever been invested in, every war that has ever been fought, has been because of somebody's religious beliefs. Now, you think that religion has to do with God. Get that notion out of your head. Religion has nothing to do with God. Religion has everything to do with beliefs. And when you disagree with somebody, I look, I was just in a situation where I was with someone and purposely in that conversation, I chose to disagree on a particular point. Now, most of the time I disagree with people because what they're stating is not a fact, but they're speaking of it as a fact. Thus, you get a disagreement from me because you don't get to promote facts to me that are not facts. You don't get to promote an opinion to me and port it off as being a fact. If you're going to talk about facts, then you have to be accurate with me or I will call you on it. I don't do this on purpose. I do this because that's the way I've always been. I do this because my mother and father recognized that when I was a child, if I saw something wrong, I spoke up. If I heard something wrong, I challenged it. I said, wait a minute, you can't do this. You can't say that. You can't speak this. You cannot tell them that. That was always me. So please understand that there is no me getting out on video and telling people A, B, C, D, E, F, and G and not recognizing the value, power, and importance of giving people truthful information. A lot of people say, well, I have truthful information, but their information is based on what they heard. When you all hear me speak, you notice that I am not talking about what I heard. I'm talking about what I can prove. So shall we get back to status? Because status is everything. But status is not the concept that you've come to understand. It is not a quote unquote legal concept or legal argument. We've been having discussions about the infinite state and gaining control of the securities held in one's minor account. And everybody's been wondering, how do they do that? Well, technically, you just have to announce yourself. You don't need anybody's permission to be you. No, no, no. Go ahead. Rethink that. They say you have to gain control of the securities held in your minor account. Okay, so how do you gain this control? Who do you go talk to? Who gives you permission to gain control of your property? Now, some of you are not understanding the question because it's being placed in a way that you're not getting it right away, but you will get it. Ladies and gentlemen, these are your securities. These are the securities held in your account. For instance, Look in your wallet. No, this is not a commercial for Capital One. But go ahead, look in your wallet. Okay, who gave you permission to have a wallet? No, 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 no. Just, just focus on the question. Who gave you permission to have a wallet? Who did you have to go to and say, is it okay if I get a wallet? When you were a child, you may have had to ask your parents. But as an adult, you don't need permission to have a wallet. You don't need permission to have shoes. Okay, so again, if you don't need permission to have what you have a right to have by choice, then why are you asking someone 
how do I gain control of the securities in my account? Ladies and gentlemen, take control. Literally, take control. But don't do it under the capacity of somebody who's not sure. Okay, because look, there is a capacity of ignorance. Ignorant people get nothing. Ignorant people get nothing because they have nothing coming to them. They are not, uh, what do you say, entitled to receive anything. You're only entitled to gain control of your securities once you recognize they are yours. I couldn't just come out and tell people, hey, you have securities. The only way you can gain control of your securities is to insist on access to your property. The only way you can gain control of your securities is to insist on access to your property. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a process. The government is an administrative juggernaut, okay? They have a policy, they have a procedure for everything. I tell you this because I worked for the United States Army Corps of Engineers. No, I was not an engineer. I was literally just a stocking agent. However, nothing in that federal building got to anybody at all, whether it be a pen, whether it be a piece of paper, whether it be a copy machine, nothing got to a single person in anybody's so-called authority without coming through my office. And I'm a teenager. I am a 16-year-old kid. And as this teenager, what I did was quite simple. My employers hired me. I knew the young lady who was the supervisor. Well, actually, my sister did. They hired me as a result of their impression of me. They thought that I was exceptional. They thought that I was a exceptional teenager and had a lot of smarts for my age. Okay? And so they hired me. And when they hired me, they had to create policies for the building. This was in the 80s, and bureaucracy was just starting to get its foothold on the entirement of society. And so what they needed to do is they needed to come up with policy. They noticed that how I spoke, that I was already using legal terms, and that my thinking and logic and how I broke things down. Yes, and I didn't realize it at the time. I was wondering why they were having, my supervisor would just have conversations with me out of the blue and they would ask me random questions. So I now realize at this late stage in life that they were testing me to see if I would be suited for the task that they were going to give me. And we were coming up with all kinds of policies. I stopped working for them because I found out that our offices, I wasn't in charge of this, but our offices also handled ballistic missiles and other armament for the United States military. It wasn't just the Army Corps of Engineers. I just worked for the division known as the Army Corps of Engineers. But technically, I worked for the federal building. And because I worked for the federal building, like I said, if any of you have been in the military, you know that everything gets done by requisition. You have to requisition this, you have to requisition that. Well, the requisitions goes through the administrative buildings of the Army for the military. The requisition goes through the administrative building for the federal buildings. Even if you're on a state level, you have to requisition supplies. You don't just get to order supplies. Well, people say requisitioning is ordered. In. Look up the word requisition. I have never done so, but I want you to understand it's a whole lot more detailed than ordering. Now, you do know that requisition comes from the word request. I don't know. I've never looked up the terminology. But again, in the military, you can't just request a pin. See, you can't just go into the office and open a cabinet and grab a box of pens. 
can't go down to the corner store and just say, hey, I'm in the military, we need some pins. It doesn't work like that. There is a procedure, a process that must be followed. Must be followed. I say all of this to explain to each of you that because there is a process that must be followed, that process is universal for every aspect of the government for the United States. That process is absolute for every aspect of the European Union and the state or nation known as Great Britain. You have to follow the bureaucratic processes. If you fail to follow those processes, you can accomplish very little. If you fail to follow the processes, you will accomplish very little. So you have securities. We've already demonstrated to you that information. We've already demonstrated to you that the federal government has thousands of trust agreements that they enter into every single year. Thousands of trust agreements. But they have somehow came up with a notion that if they, being the servants, created a trust agreement, they could somehow bound you to that trust agreement. And they can make themselves the beneficiaries. So what does SACCOM do? SACCOM understands equal protection of law. So we create the very same trust agreements, but the problem in the past is how do we, a trust agreement, the word agreement means contract. So a trust agreement is a contract. How do we bind these individuals to our contracts the same way they bind us to their contracts? As I explained to quite a few of you, Bradley Christopher Stark came up with the concept of performance contract. Now, he's not the first person to come up with performance contract. No, he came up with a performance contract with an arbitration clause embedded in it. Why? Because it doesn't matter who you are, you did not know the value of arbitration agreements. And if you go over the cases such as Henry Schein versus Archer and White Sales, when a Supreme Court says that the courts are not at liberty to rewrite the statute, the Supreme Court was saying it 100% correctly. Now, the courts are still trying to rewrite the statute. They're coming up with all kinds of technicalities, not concerned about their technicalities, because that technicality is not the law. That technicality is their way of circumventing the law. Most people have been receiving from the courts negative responses, whether they have an arbitration agreement or anything of that sort, even when they receive a ticket and they challenge the ticket, even when they attempt to challenge the court's jurisdiction, the court is ignoring them. Ladies and gentlemen, you have to not let the court, the judge, the opposite party who is represented by attorneys change the subject. Because that is what their main goal is, is distraction. Why? Because as long as they can keep you distracted and change the subject, then you will get off point. Your attack, your proceeding to uh, validate yourself, your position, well, that will all change. Because now you'll be so busy trying to argue some new point that they just brought up, some new argument that has nothing to do with the subject matter. You cannot let them do that. You have to stick to your plan, your position that you had at the beginning. Now, what will happen while you're going through this process is they will try to assert their status. Well, they're public servants. These are all officers. These are administrative entities. Their capacity is not that of a person with rights. Their capacity 
is that of someone who is operating under an administrative agency that is purporting to have authority, authority to control you. Why? Because you have subjected yourself to their jurisdiction. That is why the Supreme Court and the other courts of the world says that the very first principle in law, in order for you not to be subjected to someone else's jurisdiction is that you must challenge the jurisdiction. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you're entering the court and you're entering the court under one of their statutes, you can come under their statute, but you will have to limit your subjecting yourself to that statute. You will have to have a phrase to the point and effect that this is only to the extent as the statute is applicable to the request and not beyond. And then you let them know that you're coming under the provisions of common law. And that shall be the governing principles and laws for the matter in which you're proceeding. And then you simply make the statement, if I do not have the right to do this, then you have three business days to document why I do not have the right to common law, provisions of law. Just that simple. And you put that in every document. You put that in your trust agreements. For instance, we have a case that we have two individuals that a bank was suing. And we chose to get heavily invested in that particular case because it covered two separate states. So it had diversity of jurisdiction. The value was over $75,000. We decided to come into that case because that case was prime. And it was nine attorneys coming at these two individuals. And then they added our names. Well, we went into that case and every step of the way there was ma manipulation. There was an attempt to change the subject matter. There was an attempt for the attorneys just to throw something in there into court and the court has been green lighting what they've been doing. Ladies and gentlemen, honestly, the truth, we don't care about the courts green lighting what the attorneys are doing. We don't care as to whether or not the courts are honorable or not. Remember, it is the judge is not the court. The court is the institution. It has nothing to do with that building, has nothing to do with the robe. It has nothing to do with the clerks. The court is not an entity in the sense that where you can step into the court. The court is the concept. It is the illusion of justice. That's what the court is in the United States, Great Britain, and any of these other so-called venues where they claim to be administering justice. Now, I want you all to understand, the courts do not administer justice. They were never authorized to administer justice. It was the preamble for the U.S. Constitution that stated that. However, the preamble for the Bill of Rights says something quite different. All you got to do is go to archive.gov and go to the Constitution. Go to the Bill of Rights. Read what it originally said. See what jurisdiction you are under. See how this United States courts is not a judicial branch of government, that it is 100% administrative. See how statutes are not law when you look up positive and non-positive laws. All you have to do is put the phrase in Google, positive and non-positive law. And you will see that only the titles are quote unquote positive law because it's all presumption. So when you walk into a courtroom, they presume that you're coming in there in the capacity of one who is surrendering or waiving their rights. 
How so? Because you're submitting to the court's jurisdiction. Involuntary servitude, unless for the punishment of a crime to which one has been duly convicted, is illegal. So the only way you can be made to be subject is if you volunteer. So let them know I'm not here as a volunteer. Let that be the first words out of your mouth. Somebody pulls you over. I am not volunteering to participate in your investigation. I am not volunteering to answer your questions. I am not required to answer your questions. But however, you are required to answer mine. You'll get some brushback. But remember, if you are pulled over, somebody is recording that conversation. And that's all you have to do when you go before the person in the robe. You just let him know that he subjected me to involuntary servitude. No, I told him I was not volunteering. I was not there in the capacity of anything other than my natural person. Stop saying that you are a living being. People say I'm a living flesh and blood person. You don't have to say I'm living flesh and blood. Okay. Again. The legal phrase is natural person. The legal term is natural person. There is no need to say flesh and blood because when you do that, they want to now presume that you are a sovereign citizen. You don't want nobody presuming that you're a sovereign citizen. So ladies and gentlemen, let's segue back to capacity. When you go before a judge, that judge is sitting in the capacity of a judge. The person is not actually a judge. That's why when you look at the law, it says deprivation of rights under the color of law, under the authority of law. They're sitting in the capacity of someone who has authority. Go throughout the scriptures. Notice the book of Romans. It talks about government sitting in their relative positions, that they have been placed in their relative positions. So this is a capacity situation. This is a capacity world. You believe that you maintain your natural capacity every step of the way, every minute of the day. You do not. When you are out in public, it is presumed that you are now in the capacity as a member of the public. You don't wear a sign on your forehead saying, I'm not a member of the public. You don't wear a sign on your forehead saying I'm a natural person, living flesh and blood. You're not required to. There is no reason for you to be announcing yourselves, but you are in a bureaucratic capacity status society. Don't believe me? All rise. The honorable blah, 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 blah is now taking the bench. You may have a seat. Now, all rides is a command. You may have a seat as an offer. So not only do they present to you their offer, stand up, but then they give you an opt out. You may. And everybody sits. Now, does that mean that you don't stand? No, that's not what that means. That means that the first thing you do is say, I object. You can say this. Well, first you made an offer for us to rise. You made an offer by inviting me into this arena. But I object. I need to know what your jurisdiction is. I need to know what is the capacity of these proceedings. Because even the proceedings have a capacity, ladies and gentlemen. You, you all know it. They, they, everybody talks about there's a private side of the court and there's a public side. So find out what's the capacity of the court. What capacity is the court sitting in? What capacity is the judge sitting in? Is it administrative or is it under the judicial power of government? Not the judicial branch of government. Forget the judicial branch of government. Go back and look at the Bill of Rights. There is nothing about branches of government. There's no tree. 
There is nothing about branches of government. That is stuff they came up with over the years. So find out what the capacity of the court is. Say, because I'm here in my capacity as administrator, not as surety, not as trustee. You can say executor. I am perfectly as a person fine with you saying executor. Why? Because you get to define who you are and what capacity you're operating in. But what if they ignored me because I've already tried all of this? We're not there yet. So hold on. We have to talk about the beginning before we talk about the end. Yes, there are many of you who are more advanced than others. But sorry, you're only as fast as the slowest cog. Okay, you're only as fast as the shortest person in the race. Not talking about so-called little people, but go ahead. Take a six foot five person and a seven foot four person and a seven foot eight person and put them in a race together. The seven feet individuals have a longer stride than the six foot five. So the six foot five, although he may be faster, it takes him twice the distance to get to where the other two are. So he is not faster, he's actually slower. So you're only as fast as the shortest man in the race. So ladies and gentlemen, we cannot speak of the finality of what to do unless we talk about what to do at the beginning. So you place on the record who you are, the same as they place on the record who they are. They give you a title. They say the honorable this, the honorable that. They give you a title. So why not you give them not just simply a title, but give them a legal title for which they must understand your capacity of being there in that capacity. I'm not going to tell you what the words are. This is research you have to do. But there are quite a few capacities that you can come in where you represent. They give you forms all the time, tell you to sign it as authorized representative. They literally tell you, sign this as the authorized representative. With the form, the form has signature authorized representative. Look at the checks. The checks are not saying you're the entity, it's just saying you're authorized to speak on that person's behalf. Wait, hold on. I just want you all to follow me. The IRS has a form 56, and all of the people that I've known have been using the form 56 for government agents. Why aren't you using the form 56 for yourself? to speak on behalf of that entity. Getting that Form 56 notarized and having it placed on the record, and when you go into that arena, having a copy of that Form 56. Look, I don't know. I've never said that that way before, ever. But again, as I said, it's all about capacity. All of you have not been establishing your presence. So how can you gain control of anything if you have not established your presence? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to pause this just for a second. I will be right back. It will only be a second for you, but it'll be quite a few seconds for me.